I am delighted to say that joining me on the Godcast today is one of the great characters from Doctor Who. Oh no, it's not a Cyberman. It is the one, the one and only D Kelly. Now, D Kelly is known to some people as White D. She's become a British TV personality, and um, 2014 and 2015, she appeared in the TV documentary series Benefit Street. And then after that, she also took place in Celebrity Big Brother. So, Dee, it's really great to welcome you to the Godcast. How are you doing? I was doing all right. I got a sticky up hair bit as well. Look, so much for getting up, getting up early. And he's straightening the hair and then putting on the Cyberman ears. And what can I say? It's all gone to part. It's a great look. Great See, look. I thought I thought that. I thought, should I go with the silver or should I go with the... Yeah, I opted for the silver. Silver grey brings out the colour in my eyes. So where are you, Dee? Where are you? In Birmingham? Uh, you still down there? I am, yes. I have. I'd never go far from Birmingham. Born and bred in Birmingham. And I absolutely love it. I really do. So we'll get to all the benefit street stuff in a minute, but let's let's go down, let's have a trip down uh, memory lane. What what was life like for D growing up in Birmingham? Were there were they happy times or not? Oh my God, yeah. It's um, I mean, you know, like when you talk about this, born in nineteen seventy one, nineteen seventy one. I know she doesn't look old enough. I hear you say, in good old Dudley Road Hospital in Birmingham. Um, born to Irish parents, you know, Dan and Kathy. Um, I had the best childhood ever. Do you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like there was just me and my sister. Um, but obviously the Irish family, massive Irish family. And it was, it was just, you know, lived on a little street. Um, it was just amazing. Were you know, it was like, sister? Nah. No. <laughs> You have a good old scrap or two, did you? Do you know, I'll tell you what it is. It's kind of like um, chalk and cheese, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's like I was the eldest, the eldest sibling by two years, two and a half, half years. No, it wasn't like that. It was, um, yeah, growing up, it, it was great. You know, um, I had my set of friends. She had her set of friends. But we were just all sort of gelled. You know, it is proper like you see in like the old TV programmes. Every child out playing, you know, mm. every front door open. You could mm. go in and out of anyone's house, be fed and play, got told off by anybody. But we were really lucky, to be fair, because we had Edgebaston Reservoir was practically just at the top of our road. I'm doing directions. It's like just at the top of the road. Just up there. And, yeah, just up there. We had the reservoir there. We had the park there. And... <laughs> And, you know, it, it was just fantastic because uh, you could go fishing and swimming and, you know, for inner city Birmingham, I suppose, you know, you don't realise until you're much older. We were probably really, really spoilt as, as kids with what we had around us. Mm, yeah. And you, you told me you had a Roman Catholic upbringing. Yes. You know, we had the, um, obviously, you know, the Irish we're, we're, we're Catholic, so we had the church at that end of the road, you know what I'm saying it's uh, the church across the road from the pub and, you know, yeah it was it was brilliant, went to Catholic school went to St Patrick's on W Road and then I went to St Paul's All Girls School for my senior school education, Right. Ta taught by nuns, taught by right. the good old nuns So did you, you got confirmed and all that, your mass was was a, a regular thing for you was it, as a young girl? Yeah, definitely. Every Sunday, every Sunday. And then obviously during school, it was, you know, um, I had my, my communion, first communion and then confirmation. And yeah. And you, you it was really a, good times. Yeah. You had a vicar that you were fond of. Is that right? You, you told me the other day about a vicar that was really, oh. you know, tell us about him. See, and this is the thing, you know, back then you kind of, um, obviously churches were always sort of, packed to the rafters in like the 70s and the 80s and you know the, the the priest the parish priest tended to like once he got a church he was like there forever and um father Nalan was our, our our priest oh and he was just such a character you know he was an irish priest and 
built up a rapport with with everybody but he was like I mean you know I don't I don't know if it's much, well it probably is much different here now but obviously back then the priest you know they used to do the mass service and then nip over the road and socialize in the pub and have a little drink but it was I was telling you the other day he sort of like he was such a close family friend that I remember, I remember my dad had gone to midnight mass the one Christmas Eve and obviously they'd left midnight mass and they'd gone over the uh, over the road for a drink and my dad and the priest had come back to the house a little bit worse for wear in fact they were absolutely <laughs> steaming and they they ate my mum's turkey they were looking for something to eat and they ate, they ate half of my mum's turkey on sandwiches. Really? And oh my God, I can remember, obviously, because as a child, you, you do you used to get up about four o'clock in the morning, mm. if not earlier, to run downstairs and see what Father Christmas has brought you. And all I can remember is my mum just standing there screaming like a banshee, throwing this priest out of the house. And I was saying, and you can take him with you as well about me dad. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Dee, because it's like, that, that is a different generation now. Those were the days where the priest could knock on the door, literally walk in and say, hi, cup of, and so they go, cup of tea, father. Yeah. It's not something I could do these days. Definitely, and they'd kind yeah. of like... That, and that's what I'm saying. It's kind of like, it's when did it all change? Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of like, you know, it, it, it's weird because, you know, you, you could come home from school and the priest would be there or you'd wake up in the morning and the priest... It's kind of like it went from house to house, you know, mm. knowing what time everybody, like, cooked the breakfast yeah. or cooked the dinner yeah. or cooked the tea, you know. But it, it, it was great because it tended, you know, sort of all the family, you know, family parties and stuff, you know, if it was mum's birthday or dad's birthday, they'd have a drink up in the pub and, you know, the priest would be there. It was always like, you know, the star of the party would always be the priest. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> so is that, I is remember, that, uh, go on. So I remember the ones, I think it was my mum's, it would have been my mum's 50th or 40th, I think. Right. They're probably a 40th. And he actually dressed up in um, a gorilla outfit as um, to present a mum's Thought she had um, mum thought she had a stripper gram. She was like, I swear to God, if he takes his and then like, it was the priest. <laughs> Let me neck. I mean, I think I'm in the wrong church, oh. you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? Catholics, way. <laughs> <laughs> so is that is that Roman Catholicism stayed with you, D, throughout your life? Is it kind of you know just simmering there, or is, is it part of you? Do you think? It is, and obviously, you know, I've gone on now. I've got two children. Um, my daughter. We just uh, we just lost Dee then for a minute. So we were talking about uh, Dee's uh, kind of Roman Catholic upbringing and whether it, it stayed with you. So um, let's just move on a bit, Dee. Were, were you all, were you good at school? What, what were you like? Were you uh, academically? Were you I mean, okay? Yes, I was absolutely fine. Um, I was like really sort of this. Miss Sonny's just bringing me a cup of tea. God bless him because he wants his headphones back, but he's going to have to wait. You know. Um, <laughs> This is Mama's time. No, I, 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 I was. I mean, I loved school. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, I, I probably. I mean, I did. I did. Um, I played. I, oh, I, this is. This feels like a confession. Um, it's okay, my child. Carry on. Yeah, I played truant from school once, and um, I got caught out. That's. How rubbish I was, do you know what I mean? It's so, um, yeah, my mum caught me. Uh, I, I don't suppose it helped that I hid my school bag behind the TV in the living room, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and she caught me and, and I got a, a right, let's say, a right good old Irish Catholic telling off. <laughs> And um, once you received one of them tellies off, you tended to like just be, behave yourself. But um, I loved my education. I mean, um, senior school, like I said, it was sort of, you know, St. Paul's, which was the big convent in Birmingham. Um, so it was a very strict senior school experience. Mm. And I kind of, you know, when you hit a certain age, you do, you do tend to kind of rebel a little bit. Um, you know, got, I got, you know, not just 
just me, obviously. I was very easily led, Alex. I was as well. My yeah. friends were very... I think it's all my friends, because I still see a lot of my school friends right. now. Um, they were very kind of like, you know, so keen to get me into trouble. Yeah. So they... you know, we, got, we got caught smoking at the back of the convent the once and, yeah. or had the, and had the ruler, you know, right. Oh, my oh, yeah. God, right yeah. there. And, you what know, were the, and what were the nuns like? Were they all right? Did you get on well with them? They're strict. Um, the nuns. Yeah. And it's, it, but in a way, it was kind of like good. Um, obviously, you know, I remember the first year um, that we started senior school, we were in the convent, we were having a maths lesson and someone let off one of the fire extinguishers. But obviously the maths lesson was in the convent part of the school. And we got banned from going on any school trip through the whole of our period in senior school. And we actually really didn't. <laughs> they didn't let us go on any outings or anything. So, well, but um, but the, the head teacher at the time was Sister Agnes. Um, uh, and you know, sort of looking back now, I'm kind of like, you know, she was, she, she was amazing. I mean, I spent, you know, some time outside her office and, um, <laughs> on a chair and you'd be Deirdre Kelly you again <laughs> oh you know she's struggling she'll soon catch on that you know I'm being led astray yeah I was a bit like that I was always in detention but fortunately our our head deputy headmistress lived in the village and she often gave me a lift home we became quite good friends <laughs> yeah, it's just the little things isn't it like you know trying to sign your mum's name on your homework book and mm. you know things like that it was nothing you know or having a chat with the boys from another school you know over the fence and you know little little things when you're supposed to be doing PE but obviously I'm not obviously I'm not a PE type of person so yeah I'd rather have a chat with the lads so just uh, let's move on to the TV stuff. So, I suppose two two questions, D. How how, how do your circumstances uh, mean, mean that you were on benefits, and and how did the the show come about? Did they come knocking on the door saying we want to make this documentary? How did it work? Mm, it's like really weird. Obviously, everybody goes through things in life, don't they? Um, and I can honestly sit here and just be completely honest with you guys, because because I am a very honest kind of person. I did. I've made one very, very stupid mistake in my life. And it's due to circumstances, I suppose. I'm not blaming anybody but myself. Um, hardships and stuff. And I actually I did. I, I worked for Birmingham City Council and I did actually, you know, I lost my job because I got the sack. Um, basically, I borrowed money that I shouldn't have borrowed to pay nursery fees. But then, you know, I kind of, I was the one that actually said, you know, I've done something wrong because I owned up to the fact that I'd actually, I'd actually done it. Knew it was wrong, but obviously that led to me losing my job. Now, that was in um, 2006, I think possibly around 2006. Um, but like I said, that's how. So I'd worked my whole life, obviously, from leaving school. I left school at 15 and then went on the good old YTS. And then I'd worked my whole way through till that. Um, but it, it's life that leads you on that course, isn't it? You know, I was in a relationship. I'd had, um, I'd had a child. Um, and it, it, it was mad because, you know, my partner, I didn't realised at the time was addicted to drugs and whereas I was working and he was stay at home and none of the bills were being paid and and things like that so I'd lost my house and lost kind of everything so you know it, it's the same as like you know a few people out there you kind of when you fall into bad times you do stupid things um so that's when I kind of went on to the into the benefit system so contrary to what a lot of people think I haven't been in it my whole life if that makes sense mm -hmm. um the documentary um it's really weird because the documentary it just um they kind of just appeared on the street and was like talking to everybody and, and we just kind of thought it'd be um, a good thing to do at the time because it wasn't initially supposed to be about the subject benefits. What they wanted to film and to show was basically how everybody on this tiny little street in Birmingham 
looked out for each other and helped each other, which in a way, Alex, had flashbacks to like my childhood. Like, you know, all the kids used to play together. All the doors were open. People could go in and out of each other's house. Mm -hmm. No one ever went hungry. No one, do you know what I mean? And and it was about the good old community spirit, which was really a massive, massive part of life on James Turner Street because we were one great big massive family. But then obviously just before they went to air the documentary, they slapped the label Benefit Street on it. And that's kind of when we know, I mean, come on, you know, they say, isn't it the most controversial subjects that you want to air on a TV show? Benefits, religion, immigration. We knew we were well and truly stuffed. Did it become a bit of a TV hit, for want of a better word, quite quickly? How soon did you realise that you were going to be catapulted into kind of national fame as a result of this? Was it quick? The documentary aired at nine o'clock on a Monday night. At half past ten, you could not walk up that street. It was full of people, cars, bibbing the horns. Because that's the thing you see. The very beginning, the first line, I think, of the, of the intro in the documentary is James Turner Street, Birmingham. Well, there you go. You've told the whole world where mm. we live. And I'm telling you from about, and this is no word of a lie, from about an hour and a half, if that, after that first episode aired, the street was full of people. Wow. That is the power yeah. of the telly, isn't it? Yeah. We, we, I was on the news on, before Christmas where a pastor and, and that was, the phone just went crackers. I couldn't believe how quickly, you know. It's mad. And I think because when you're specific to an area as well, I suppose like you think 2014, it was sort of seven years ago. Yeah, I just had to do a quick kind of thing. Don't look stupid now by failing your maths, you know. Um, it was kind of like, I suppose when people saw kind of, oh, hang on a minute. That's where I'm from. That's, that's where I live. You know what I mean? Winston Green, Birmingham. You, you tend not to sort of hear about or watch when you're watching telly you're kind of like you know oh so and so in Blackpool oh that looks nice but then they get kind of excited I suppose that ah oh, our ends are being represented now on mm. on this show and it turned into the biggest show um the biggest show ever I think at that stage for Channel 4. Yeah and how did that affect your life the spin-offs and the media and all that that kind of that was a bit mad, wasn't it? I mean, the roof. Tell us about that. This is what I'm saying. It's like, you know, it's 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 bittersweet, isn't it? Because obviously, through the aftermath of the documentary, shall we say, um, I went on to do, I don't know, I think I've put up hundreds and hundreds of TV shows. I'd hate to even try and count how many radio shows and magazines I've done, but you know, the plus side is. It got me out of the system, back off the, you know, back off the dreaded benefits, as people call it. Um, so it's, but, you know, the downside is it completely ruined anything that we had, you know, we had a, on that street before the documentary aired. Mm. It, it was just weird because I think there was so much, it, it's the Marmite effect. Everything's the Marmite effect, isn't it? You either love it or you hate it. But, you know, I think... Um, we were very surprised that there was, I think there was more people out there could relate to us, if that makes sense. And like, hang on a minute, they're just like us. Mm. And I think that's what kind of, you know, led to sort of, I suppose, well, still being like invited onto shows. And so, I mean, seven years down the line now, Alex, do you know what I'm saying? And it's kind yeah. of like, you still get recognised in supermarkets kids and still get invited to stuff and mm. it's like wow it's it's still really really surreal so what happened did you like do you get an agent quite quickly then or, or did you get somebody to look after your kind of your bookings or management well you're kind of like you know i was in my 40s i'd never ever wanted to be in this life i'd you, you know um, i don't even know what i thought might have happened by appearing in this documentary um life did change it did change and all these you know as these requests started coming in 
like you know we want you want celebrity big brother and I'd sit and start laughing I'm like celebrity big brother but the more people kept saying who do, oh she ain't no celebrity who does she think she's and I think the more people that say to me that I can't do something I'll do it just kind of to say you know something watch this space and that's kind of why I, I, I did that but it's the same as everything isn't it you think you suddenly become high profile and the sharks do start come swimming out of the sea. They don't just stay in the sea. They come swimming out of the sea. So I've met me fair, me fair share of sharks yeah. on, on this journey, to be fair, Alex. It's, a, it's an incredible story, really, isn't it? Because, um, you know, so, so do you still have an agent now or do you look after your own affairs? Or, or... Do you know something? You sit here and you kind of think to yourself, you know, I'm not stupid. You know, I mean, I've been stupid and I've been very naive, I suppose, in the past. But you're kind of like, how hard is it to answer a phone call or answer an email? Mm. It isn't. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's not, I, I, I'm majority now, just do it myself. Yeah. And and that that Big Brother experience, uh, oh, I, know, you must, I get the feeling you really enjoyed that. And I know you, you, you know... Um, you're really great mates with Kelly Maloney, who was on it. But well, just remind people who was in the show with you, because it was such a, a cult. It was such a cult show, wasn't it? See, this is the thing. I've watched that because, I, as like you know, should we say, like D sitting at home was so obsessed with like looking into people's lives. It's called being nosy, isn't it? The reality of it, Alex. I'm I'm really nosy, um, and I've watched that from day one. I've never ever ever wanted to be in it, but then obviously you know when I got offered this, I was kind of like, oh. But the media hype and everything was just absolutely it just exploded and I kind of thought and it, you know I spoke to the family and stuff and I said I've been offered this and obviously you know it was a pay packet um I thought let's just go I made sure the kids were looked after and I went in there kind of went in to escape to escape all the press attention and the, the hatred out there and the you know because there was a lot and 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 it it was just fantastic because it was like rehab and I was in like you said I'm, I'm amazing friends with Kelly Maloney I absolutely love Kelly and um, we were in there with it was it there was Audrey Harrison Kelly Ricky from Georgie Shaw George from Gogglebox we had um Steph from Made in Chelsea Adele from Bewitched and James Jordan Strictly Dancer and then we had a couple of Americans thrown in <laughs> Yeah, our series was the first year that an American had won it, but hey ho. Who was it? Just remind who was it, who won it? Yeah, me arch nemesis Gary Boosie. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Do you know something? I'll tell you something. Everyone comes out and I don't actually know. My hair is going worse and worse as this is going along. <laughs> it's like the look, the drag down a bed look, Alex. <laughs> Do you know something? Gary Boosie, obviously, he was a Hollywood superstar. Do you know what I'm saying? And I was completely and utterly in awe of him. Mm. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, mentally and physically, he shouldn't have been allowed in there. It was like, because we were just, we just turned into 24-hour-a-day carers. Mm. And it did, it did kind of take, you know, take the fun out of it. And yeah, but hey-ho. Do you talk about um, some of the sharks and the hatred? Just, just tell us about that a little bit. And and now it, you know, you know, you, you're a tough old girl anyway. I know that, but but actually, you know, there comes a point where it must have got pretty grim. Just tell us about some of that. Do you know, hands on heart, it did get grim. And how I have, I, you know, how I haven't broken, I just don't know. Because it's like I said to you, um, it's a controversial subject, isn't it, benefits? You get the, you know, the the taxpayers who are like, oh, look at them, you know, the scroungers, benefit cheats, this, you, you know, tramp and everything. And then it's kind of like, you know, Alex, I'm going to be hands on heart, honestly. I'd never, ever experienced racism in my life until that show aired and that was all down to the colour of my children's skin you know and and I think that's you know that's a, a big thing about Birmingham I think growing up because like I said to you I was in my 40s so I'd spent 40 odd years on this earth yeah with 
without having anything targeted to it or or any emphasis on the colour of someone's skin until this documentary aired because the hate I received directed towards the colour of my children's skin would absolutely shock the life out of you. And that's tell me, when... Tell me what was said. I was, um, you know... It, it, it's you get the extremists on my daughter say and I was called um what was it a mixed breeding whore am I allowed to say that word yeah you know what I mean it's like I was referred to as you know a mixed breeding whore and um end lover and this that and the other and the kids were called you know flipping licorice all sorts and you know and, and it was like really extreme and I'm kind of like you know summer who you to come after my kids and I think that's what it does you know the protection instincts and I think that's why I've done so many like tv shows and radio shows because I will look after mine Alex you come for my you come for me and mine and I'll come back for you and that's my mindset do you know what I'm saying and I've always been that look at the state of me I'm not worried about you yeah. Go on, it's it's in, it's it's important stuff. This though, I mean, it is important stuff, yeah. and that's kind of like, and it was like, how? Because I don't know if I was just living in a little bubble or what, and it was kind of how on earth can people be so vile and nasty? Mm. And I tell you how, because it's now clicked in my head, Alex. Because they're sitting behind a keyboard. Not one per, no, probably, no, not one person has ever, ever come up to me and said something negative to my face. And do you know why? Because I'd knock them out. <laughs> no, but it, it's the confrontation thing. Do you know what I'm saying? And this again, it's kind of, but it still doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt. No. Because. I shouldn't have to, you know, I shouldn't have to be arguing with someone about the colour of my kid's skin or or the area that I live mm. or my circumstances. It's none of your business. Mm. But I understand to a certain extent when you've been put into the public eye, you do obviously leave yourself open to, you know, criticism and opinions. Everyone's entitled to an opinion. I don't have to listen to it and I don't have to agree with it either. No, so, mm. so they, I mean, we, we run a food bank at St Matthew's and um, I know you're involved with food banks. And um, just tell me, so, some, some people I talk to, they just do not accept that food banks are necessary and they're just like places for people to get food on the cheap or for nothing. And the money that they don't spend on that just goes on taxes and fags and booze. What would you say to people who hold that, that view? See, again, I think you can't say it doesn't happen. Do you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, because it probably does to a certain extent. Now, obviously, through the, um, through the group, um, I co-run a business, a business called Birmingham Says No to Knife Crime and Youth Violence here in Birmingham. Um, I've set it up with my partner, Rachel Warren, who's a school teacher. She actually taught my kids. Um, now, obviously, due to lockdown, we predominantly we put on free events for young people because we believe that young people should be able to, to do what they love doing, you know, and it shouldn't have to cost them a fortune because all these services have been withdrawn and they've been overtaken by money-making corporations. Now, I'm sorry, some young kid in Birmingham can't afford £5 to play, to kick a football round on a football pitch for half an hour. You know, it's kind of lost its way. So that's kind of like our hope. But due to lockdown, we haven't been able to do any live events. So we were called in to help, um, help at a local food bank. And we're like, yeah, obviously, you know what I'm saying? And, and and the need was just absolutely unreal. But the thing is, we go out, but, you know, we go out and we see these families and, you know, we're providing them with food and parcels, looking after the kids. I mean, a lot of our referrals come from local schools. But that, again, it doesn't mean that we haven't had the ones that are basically using it as an online food delivery shop. And this is what I'm saying. There's the fine line between need and greed, which we've discovered um, a lot. But that doesn't take away from the families that do really, really need it. I mean, come on, Alex, something like food. No child should ever go hungry. Nobody should never, ever not have access to food. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's kind mm. of like it's the, the need for it has just risen so much. 
And it is to do with, you know, all you have to do is just listen to the news, see what's going on. You know, how many millions of people have lost their jobs? How many millions of people have lost their homes? How many p- millions of people have lost lost family members? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like... And there are people... You know, often. food is as basically expensive. Yes, is it? Yeah. And, the, and you, as you say, there are people that come and uh, milk it and... You know, but, but it's the same big... as you'll find it in any walk, anything that you do, mm. anything that you do, you'll always have the ones, you know, because some people's mindset are, oh, oh, that was nice, you know, oh, can I get this every week? Mm, if you need it, but if you kind of don't, yeah, I mean, we, we, we it's, it's really weird to say that you've had to like wheedle out the ones that have you used and abused because the mindset of someone who'd want to use and abuse a food bank over just for the sake of you know possibly it's like you said it is free shopping but it's sad it's sad how do you think we look beyond food banks because we've been running our food bank for a year and I, i'm just keen to move it on because i want people you know you could provide a food bank forever but i think there's a bit more work to do isn't there it's like about trying to create um, an environment where they're actually yeah, they are taking food, but maybe they're taking something else, maybe a, um, some idea how to apply for a job or maybe just how to fill in a CV or just, um, you know, it, it's... See, and this is this is happening a lot down here as well. It's kind of like, you know, um, like we had a referral come through yesterday for a young guy who's in um, supported accommodation. And he's, he's basically, we found out he hadn't had anything to eat for like about two, three days. And um, it's his, his support worker. And, and I said, you know, do you want to support him on the list like weekly? And he's like, no. He says, because I will make this young lad manage his money. And do you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like, so you've got the ones out there who will support. Mm. But then you've got, unfortunately, that you know, there's probably way, way more people who haven't got any support or haven't got a network yeah. and and that's the scary thing because a lot of people are still too proud you know alex they're too proud to actually reach out and say i'm struggling yeah. and there that that's where the worry lies yeah absolutely we have um it's the ones who haven't said i haven't so yeah we, we had a lady come d uh, d and she was like shaking she was absolutely and, and it was embarrassment she was I shouldn't be here. I'm sorry. And she just broke down in tears. And it was like really quite distressing because, you, you know, yeah. all you're doing is giving them a bag of, you know, basic food provisions. But she was so grateful. But she was absolutely ashamed. And um, she said I, I, it took her, it took her weeks to come. But the, so and, the, those, those people are the ones that really and need this, to. And this is the thing. It's, yeah. And it's kind of like, um, it, it's, it is just sad. And I mean, you kind of click on it. It's, it's you can tend to read people. I read people a lot. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like, I mean, we had someone who was volunteering with us and they volunteered with us um, for about three, about three weeks. And you know, when something just kind of like clicks and I'm like, it, it, it kind of broke my heart to be fair, because you've come here, you're giving up your time you're helping other people and you're still too proud to say that you actually need help yourself. And, you know, a sly bag, when, when I say sly bag of shopping, if that makes sense, I says, oh, we've got two extra bags here. I'll tell you what, oh, you take them because it will save us going back. Mm. And just knowing that that man, do you know what I mean? And it's like, I'm so like, I'm sick of tell, like, telling people off. Mm. At this In this day and age, it's kind of like, it's so hard, but it's nothing to be proud. You know, don't be proud. Mm. Don't sit there and, and worry and fret and feel like you're on your own. It's like you've got to kind of, you know, just reach out, just a message. We don't judge people because we've been there ourselves. Do you know mm. what I mean? That's it's right. like you say, you know, we used to do it like one week I'd go shopping and buy some bits for someone to do, and then the next week with someone else went to they'd buy bits and we'd all feed it. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I don't know, society's lost the personal mm. touch now, hasn't it? I think it's so. Kind of like you don't know who's living around you, you don't yeah. know. 
and and you know back in the day everybody knew everybody and that's and that's the problem yeah i think i think there's there's some incredibly generous people out there but i do think they've lost the ability just to be kind and compassionate in a way that you, you know like you talked about in at the beginning where every other neighbors knew each other everybody looked out mm-hmm. for each other and that still happens but i think it's 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 nowhere near how it used to be when i was a kid we're, we're a similar age i know we don't look it but but we're a similar age you're a lot older than i am and um but anyway <laughs> you, can, but, you can go off people <laughs> <laughs> so they want really really quick sorry i'm breaking up <laughs> <laughs> so so d how's things now then so you you seem quite happy everything all right you pleased where life is at the moment do you know you say ple- i'm pleased how life is at the moment because i've got two amazing children who are healthy do you know what i'm saying and 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 doing really well um I'm, I've still got my demons. I'll always have my demons, you know, in this head, because these heads are, oh, they're awful things, aren't they? <laughs> Her, honest to God. But um, I kind of have to look around and kind of think, I, I am blessed. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and I mean, because, you know, I've got, <laughs> I'm just looking over, I get a bit emotional. Um, You know, my kids are my life, Alex. Do you know what I'm saying? How old are they? Um, Caitlin's 23. She'll be proud of me for getting that right because I tend to either knock a couple of years off her. And um, and Gerard's 14. 14. 14-year-old boy. Lovely. Oh, my God. It's so different to bringing up a teenage girl, I think. But do you know what I'm saying? And it's like, I do worry about them because I'm their mum. Do you know what I'm saying? But they're absolutely golden. They've got my back. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because obviously I am very fragile in the old the old um, head department. And mm. I do tend to, you know, but I've, you know, crack up every now and again. <laughs> Shall I say? Because... I think it happens to all of us at a certain age. We, uh, can't... we, oh, we yeah. look back and we look forward and we're not too sure how, how the horizons... How, I mean, gonna... As sturdy as I look, I am a right... I'm telling you, I mean, I might look rock solid, but I'm, I am kind of like, you know, I can be like flit. I, I can be a sensitive soul, do you know what I'm saying? And it's yeah, like, yeah. it's kind of a no-win situation, isn't it? But I've got my little niece as well, God bless her. Yeah. Um, she, she was born on Christmas Day. Really? Three, yeah, three years ago. And she's a very, very special little girl. Um, yeah, so um, we, we'll pro- we have to look after her for the rest yeah. of her life, so... Indeed, just tell us about this little radio show you've got going on with uh, with uh, Kelly. That's <laughs> that's fun, is it? Do you know, it's one of them. It's every Tuesday. Oh, I love it. And this is what I'm saying. It's like me and Kelly are so different. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, but we just get on so well. And I do like... Um, I'm obviously I'm more of the innuendo kind of like um, part of our act and and Kelly's still very kind of like to a certain extent straight laced if you know what I mean yeah yeah, and um and obviously it's called loose lips and I suggested loose lips (laughs) Kelly didn't get the innuendo in that at all but that's fine I'm glad (laughs) It's just let's move on. But it, it's every it, Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's for the LG, it's particularly it's for the LGBT Tuesday. community, isn't it? It is, yes. And um it's on Medway Pride Radio. Um and it's every Tuesday, seven to eight. And of course, you're our, you were our most re- one of our most recent guests. Yeah. And it's say. just it's just covering topics, you know, and it's like, you know, just talking about just talking about things that you know happen in like the media or whatever or or picking a specialist subject and just tackling that and obviously our one was kind of regarding you know religion and the lgbt community and and it was really good and it was really interesting and i think it but just having a chat as well if that makes sense yeah it's great dear i've i've um i met you twice i think i've uh i just think i've fallen in love you're just such a salt the earth character you know, I, I think that's what people uh, is so endearing about you is there's no airs and graces you say it as it is and some people don't like that they can't cope with it but I, I love that I love that honesty and the way you are and it's been a bit I'm genuinely it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and just learn out a little bit about your journey and um you know and we must keep in touch you know got quite friendly with Keller myself oh and, definitely and see this know. is the thing I kind of like 
Yeah, and it's kind of like, and this is the thing, it's like, you know, there isn't any airs and graces. I am me, you know what I mean? I'm not perfect. Do you know what I'm saying? I never will be perfect, but who is? And this is what I mean, you know, it's kind of like, a lot of people, you do judge people, but, you know, it's my mindset is kind of like, you know, at least try and get to know that person before you start aiming your insults and stuff. I mean, I had an internet troll. I've had quite a few internet trolls, but I'm actually really good friends now with a couple of my trolls because I've actually met them and kind of, you know, said, hang on a minute. And they're like, oh God. But once you get to know a person, you do realise, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, I'd probably never, ever judge anyone that I've never met any, again, before, you know what I mean, in my life. Mm. But you've got, you know, you've got to just keep it real. You've got to keep it real. I'm just, you know, middle-aged. I think old bird, know, old bird from Birmingham. You know what, Dee? There's a lot of wisdom in that though. Because when I was a young guy, I was, I was terribly judgmental and I looked at people's appearances and think, mm, you know, but actually I really enjoy me. I love doing the Godcast because I meet so many different characters and personalities and I really try hard not to judge. And and um, I think it's a very nice bit of wisdom from you. So listen, mm. it's um, we better let your lad get, your, get those massive cans off your head so he can get back to his Xbox. Watch me next time I'll come dressed as a Dalek. <laughs> <laughs> Dee, it's been brilliant. Thanks for coming on. Oh, Alex, you're so welcome. Take care and I'll hopefully get to see you soon. We can have a cuppa in real life. We will. God bless you. Oh, look after yourself. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye Alex.